This is Starved Storefront. You probably don't have to think too hard to recall the early days of the coronavirus lockdowns. When all we wanted was an excuse to get out of our homes, bikes became that excuse. You could head out your front door and get some exercise while maintaining your social distance. It was the perfect pandemic escape. And so it was no big surprise when bike sales skyrocketed. One would think that it would be a great time to be in the cycling business. Instead, a global economy dealing with supply chain delays, factory shutdowns, and parts shortages meant that there was no supply to meet the demand. Not exactly what any business owner would call ideal. Our guest today is Dean Noor, founder of Ventum, a direct-to-consumer bike brand out of Heber City, Utah. Ventum first burst onto the scene with their triathlon bike, turning heads with its signature Z-shaped frame. From there, they quickly expanded their lineup to include road and gravel bikes to mirror national trends. Dia has big plans on the horizon for Ventum, but before he can accomplish those goals, he's got to maneuver around the global supply chain backup, just like the rest of us. So listen in as we cover everything from why starting a bike company was way more difficult than he initially assumed, why he prioritized sponsoring female triathletes in an effort to level the gender wage gap between men and women, and why he chose to partner the brand with perhaps the most polarizing figure in cycling, Lance Armstrong. Now, on to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Dia, founder of Ventum. For people who don't know, tell us what it is. Yeah, what thanks, your company guys. Do. Thanks, yeah. For, thanks for having me. Of course. What do we do? We play with bikes. We make high-end carbon fiber bikes on and the tri space, the road space. And the gravel space. We have um, one of the bikes here, which is looking yeah. pretty amazing. How did you get into bikes? Like, I, for me, like I've been someone who dabbles in a bunch of sports, whether it's like surfing or cycling. Yeah. And then you make the leap of like, I think I can do this better. I think I can create this better. What was it like for you to make well, the first step? It's interesting you say that. Like, so I came from actually the telecom background, a tech background. So I had nothing to do with bikes, but I was surrounded by bikes. So. Uh, my brother was a former professional triathlete. Had tons of my friends Olympian, were pros. Right? Uh, didn't make it, but oh, tried. Okay. Tried. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He but was high close. level, super high yeah. level. Super high level, yeah. right? And you know, coming from like a pretty efficient tech background and tech industry, I'm looking at the bike industry, and it just didn't make sense to me, right? And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. I'm looking at these machines, twelve, thirteen, fifteen thousand dollars, and I'm looking at the service that you were receiving, right? And the price tag did not match the experience whatsoever, right? And so that's really what was the first trigger to start a bike company. It was because of that. It wasn't really the technology. It wasn't, you know, I mean, because there are big companies that are doing great things, right? I mean, we're not going to knock them. You know, you all, you know them all. It's like there's nothing a, a billion-dollar company that, you know, can't figure out that a startup could, right? Yeah. So looking at the experience is where I really fell in love with the idea. At the end of the day, these are the Ferraris and the Lamborghinis. Of I was going to say, it's like the F1 of, of, yeah. of the 100%. athletic road world. 100%. Yeah. I mean, yeah. these are not $800 machines, right? right. I mean, like, we, there's a lot of designing and, and R&D that goes into 100%, the creation. 100%. I mean, we start about 4000 bucks, and the sky's the limit. We made a couple of bikes that were $32,000 each. Whoa. They went to some sheikhs in the UAE. But, <laughs> but, but my point is this. This is equivalent of Ferraris and Lamborghinis. If you had the pleasure to go shop for a Ferrari Lamborghini, good for you. But I suspect that the salesperson is quite knowledgeable and, and kind of represents the brand well, right? You know, it's not a summer intern from college who's just decided to have a job. And that's what I was finding a lot at independent bike shops, right? And I'm not here to knock them. I think there are some terrific independent bike shops. I think there are some less than terrific ones. But I would go in. And I would point out a, call it a Trek Madone, right? 16 grand, Envy carbon wheels. And I know, I mean, I know yeah. what it is. Yeah. I'm just, you know, I'm like, hey, tell me about, about this bike. And the, the 16 year old kid or 18 year old kid in front of me was like, oh yeah, oh, this bike's so fast. I'm like, okay, okay. What else? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then so I pointed then a tri bike. I forgot what it was at the time. Call it a specialized shiv, who knows? And I said, what about this bike? What's the difference? He's like, oh, that one? That one is so, so fast. And so like, like the experience that's didn't. So, that's such an interesting insight. Right? You're like, so right. So you look at it. Yeah. And again, this is not like, I'm not going to generalize on every bike shop, sure. but in a lot you, of. You problems, recognize that problem. Yeah. But repeatedly enough to know it was probably more normal Precisely. than that. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. And so I looked at it and I decided, like, you know what? This doesn't make sense. You need to have a better customer experience, right? Now, 
The other thing I figured is these brands probably wouldn't want to be represented that way either. Totally. Right? No. right. Yeah. And they don't know essentially what's happening. The relationship with the big brands, the brick and mortar ones, is from them to the dealer, right? With the buyer, whoever. And that's mm-hmm. it. That's where the relationship yeah, ends. Yeah, and they relinquish right. all control once that bike leaves that's their correct. factory. That's It's like coffee beans. Yeah. Is it? Similar, yeah. But continue. Yeah. So, so I realized right away, I was like, we got to control the whole sales cycle, right? So from pre-sale, sales, service, everything, we got to control it so that we can have a standard that matches that price tag. So that's kind of how it came about, right? That's fascinating. I'm thinking about my experience. It was very much the same thing. Like I walked into a bike shop being like, hey, I'm doing this uh, charity bike ride. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't, like, I don't, oh, wanna, I don't want to be sore every day. And they're like, yeah. what are you doing? Where are you going? Blah, blah, blah. And the guy luckily was the owner. And so he, he put me on the speed plays when they first came out. Yeah. It was a carbon fiber bike. He was like, and this is 2008. And so he was like, we're, we're giving you carbon fiber. Gave me 20% off everything. And I'm like, I know nothing. Like pick all of it. Yeah, right. And and he did. And, and he and knew. Those, and he would explain it to me. He's and like, that's this the thing. is this, this is this, this is what you're going to want. It doesn't matter at the 50 mile mark, but at 70 miles, this is what you And I was like, oh. Okay. And you got lucky. Super lucky. You got lucky. Yeah. Right? And, but if at the same time, I think about it like if he didn't do that, I probably wouldn't have bought a bike. I probably think if this guy knows the same thing that I know, or they're just talking about speed, I'm out. And yeah. I'm going to like the next shop, wherever that may be. Yeah. And you got to remember too, like, so the ones that aren't so great, they get two buying, well, they all get two buying seasons. So, you know, whether it's Trek or whatever, you, you go to, the, to, the, to those manufacturers and you get to order twice, mm-hmm. spring and fall typically, right? And so what happens is you come in and you say that you have this race, you have yeah. this event, blah, blah, blah. And you know what? You're really a size 54, but I have a 56 on the showroom. I'm going to make oh. sure you walk away with that 56. So I can't tell you how many times oh, we no. see people. That's annoying. Yeah, it's yeah. annoying and it's a disservice to the whole industry, oh, right? And I'll tell you what, because... What happens is you actually generally believe that you're a 56. Right, of course you do. Right? And everyone and then, wants to be taller anyway. So like, I'm a bigger <laughs> guy. Yeah. <laughs> and so all of a sudden you think you're a 56 and then you decide to change bike. We size you on a 54, oh, which God. is your right size. You're like, no, 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 I'm a 56. Right. Yeah. Do you understand what I mean? So, yeah. this, so it's funny you say that. This guy, he, so it was, it was November. Yeah. And so the new season, you know, yep. and it was about to be 2009. And so he's like, I could get you a really good deal on a 2008 yep. because I'm about to switch seasons. Makes perfect sense. And yeah. I was like, sweet. Yeah. And so I just, he gave me a Tarmac expert and that was it. That's Specialized, awesome. which was a great bike. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they make fantastic bikes. Yeah. So. That's fascinating. Yeah. So that's, that's so true. So that background. happened. I didn't realize that would happen. It sounds like so egregious. You know, I mean, look again, these are some of the reasons why I started the company. Yeah. Like you said, I saw the problem enough that it made me wonder. All right, so what's your first step? So yeah. now you, you solve the problem yeah. or at least you uh, identify you, the problem. You identified it. Yeah. And now I, what do you do? Where do you go from here? Honestly, you just, <laughs> you throw a caution to the wind and you just, you go for it. And I've always been an entrepreneur. So I, this is my third, so hopefully successful startup. Yeah. I know what it takes. I didn't realize how big this project was because my other companies were all on, in, in software. What did you underestimate in terms of the hard part? Oh, how expensive it was going to be. Uh, I self funded To, to this. get there? To like get to the point of, oh, I figured out the solution of uh, one? To or? even get to market. Like think okay. about the R&D that you have to put in in sure. a bike. And, sure. and there's different ways of, of making bikes. And, and you're fighting behemoths, which is another huge problem. Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. Right? And so 2020 hindsight, I think I'm, I'm glad I didn't realize what, was, what I was up against. Because if I knew, I don't know if I would have started this company, honestly. And it's still, you know, it's quite difficult, yeah. right? And the last two years have been, I mean the hardest two years out of out of my life by miles you know if you're in the bike industry you you know what i'm talking about but aren't they sold out everywhere so you know it's an interesting thing so i think one of the biggest misconceptions is that the bike industry got this huge uptick from covid mm-hmm. yeah in some sense it's true people couldn't go to the gym and they're like well I'm, let me get a bike let me go bike around central park right they're like let's have fun you know i don't want a city bike let me go get something well those bikes that got sold out super quick mm-hmm. are like $800 and below. Okay. Sure, we saw an uptick as well. There's no doubt about it. Okay. But the uptick was not nearly what it was for the entry-level models. Sure. Right? As and, you would expect, though. Right, exactly. Yeah. But but sometimes I get really... Uh, I got you, I got you. So people are selling more training wheels than, uh, yeah. than like road bikes that require you to be clipped in. Yes. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. what happened is but the demand did increase. All the components, all the raw materials, everything comes from Asia, right? Shimano, SRAM, the big boys, they all come from Asia. Well, what did Asia have that we had? 
COVID. Yeah. So did they have shutdowns? Absolutely. So they're stuck. Yeah. So they're all of a sudden, manufacturing. Yeah. exactly. And you yeah. can have everything else but one part, and it's still not a complete bike. That is exactly. We're right. dealing with that in the brewery. So we're opening a brewery, and did you? We, we're doing it it's oh. in a couple of weeks. And basically, what's happening is the the garage doors are glass. Yeah. And there's one little component in there that comes from China. Yeah. And, and that component is making its way to Ohio and has been since July. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, last yeah, yeah. year no I, <laughs> which is crazy dude, right? it's it's but i hear but the that whole door is there the whole thing except this little fine little piece yeah. i hear it over and, and I'm over like, again where's america on this can't yeah. we just copy and paste yeah it can't be that but, hard. but you got to think about like look at the supply chain right. and how how it plays out right you've got a factory shut down for months and months and months right and, and shimano specifically and then they got fires which we won't even talk about but they open up, they're not at 100%, not even at 50%. So they're slowly ramping back up, right? Yeah. And then there was a global material shortage. Think of any material, yeah. there was probably a shortage in it, right? And then there was a global container shortage. All the containers were in the US, right? right? Sitting empty. In fact, Walmart and um, Home Depot essentially chartered whole boats and brought empty containers to Asia to load up their, their stuff to bring it back to the US. Mm -hmm. And so you're looking at delay after delay after delay after delay. And then there was a huge backlog at the ports. Right. We used to clear our containers would come into Long Beach, which, oh, it's here. Yeah, so yeah. so we, are they come into Long Beach, and they get cleared that day or the next day. Our last container sat there on, uh, on the boat for 47 days. And did they charge you a lot more? Did they like 4X the price? It was more like 9X the price yeah. on our last container. And they basically, they haggle with you, right? They're like, take it or leave it. This is the well, price. yeah. I mean, like, yeah, you have no option. Do you no want option. it today? Do you want to wait? Right. You have yeah. no option. I mean, and what was happening is the queue was so long. And again, I, you know, Walmart did something also very interesting. They actually hired smaller boats that would sail out <laughs> to the boats. big freighters. Yeah. yeah. And unload containers Smart. and take them to other ports. That's like, hilarious. It's interesting. Like, I am so in tune with, with how and why we got there just because I have to be. So I quite understand it. But like as a consumer... I'd be getting really annoyed, right? You know, like, why can't you get me my bike? Why yeah. can't you do this? Why can't you do it's that? It's a bad look for you, even it, though at, it's a, a, at a macro level, it, you understand it, it's in the news, but and, no one's reading it. And the funny thing, you know, to your point is, you know, what, what do we make? What does Specialized make? What does Trek make? We make the frame, the fork, the seat post. We make the carbon parts. We don't make the, the, the crank. We don't make the chains. We don't make that. I'm actually perfectly fine on my inventory. We actually plan pretty well. We can airship. We do, you know, expensive things to, to get it done. Yeah. But so we're also at the end of the food chain, if you will, right? And so we're at the mercy of everybody else. So okay. that adds. Does this make you rethink the whole industry in terms of like components? Like, are you now yeah. thinking like, okay, can we make a bike that you can? Is there like going to be a, a, like a pick and play? Oh, it would, or something it, like you that. You know, yeah. well here, well. The answer is we can't get into components manufacturing just because the giants are so big and they have a monopoly. I think what saved us during COVID is our business model, which is direct consumer. And it's everything is assembled, finished, and ships out of Utah. So we have 60,000 different combinations across all our sizes, colors, and specs at Bentham. Inventory nightmare, but... That inventory, which was so valuable and so limited during COVID, sits on a shelf. And so when you order the bike and you wanted that red 56 with this wheel, that's when that inventory gets allocated to that build. So it was very efficient as opposed to the big boys, they manufacture and assemble in Asia. Mm. So, oh, wow. so do you see that component? Double, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's on that bike. Like, you know, oh, I wanted the blue. Well, it's on the red one. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of what saved us. We were, we were able to be very, very efficient with our inventory. How do you go about finding out like where to even produce the, the, the carbon fiber? The, the actual material, like most carbon f uh, fiber comes from Japan and Korea. And every bike manufacturer is pretty much the same region in, in two different countries in Asia, in Taiwan and in, in China. Okay. We're all right next to each other. Can you reuse it? No. Okay. So no. that's still not figured out yet. No, we don't. Re no, you cannot recycle. I'm sure you can recycle scraps. Yes. But like, like we can't take a bike frame looking like that yeah. and reuse it. Okay. Uh, that would be an interesting though, huh? So a buddy of mine, we started a company a long time ago. He was an MIT guy. And that yeah. became like, he was, his obsession was, he was a cyclist also. And his yeah. whole thing was, how do we get like at scale, like, like, size of cars how do we get carbon fiber how do we pick apart the sheets bring them down to their molecular level yeah. heat them somehow and then are able to put them back like almost like wax yeah 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 and and then reuse it 
and uh, he was on that thing for two years, like really trying to figure out. How do you do? Out. Do you have his Can't. number? Can I get it? <laughs> yeah. I have his number. I can introduce you. I can for sure introduce you after this. He started going into 3D printing and yeah. plastics instead because yeah. I think that's an easier lift. But he was trying to figure that out yeah. um, for a long time. And I hate to say it doesn't seem possible because it, it, I think it is yeah. if you add like a certain something to it. But he couldn't figure it out. And if he got it to where it needed to be, it was also massively expensive. Yeah. So oh, he was I'm thinking sure. about it more for like car hoods. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah, make yeah, the car yeah. lighter, yeah. a little bit easier. Yeah. Like this is hard. This is a game of millimeters. Yes. Whereas on a car hood, it's kind of less involved it's a sheet right no yeah. absolutely yeah so then you've got the problem identified and you know exactly what you need to do but interestingly enough you went into triathlon first right yeah it's because that's what we knew and mm -hmm. so we figured if we can go into a niche saturated market and do okay there will be a in theory <laughs> will be easier when we go to the other sectors like road and gravel and so on and so forth and also the, our first model was the, um well is the ventum one and i wish i um had one of the bikes, but you can see it online. It looks very futuristic. The reason we start with that product, because we felt there was the least amount of innovation in that space. Because if you think about it, triathlon didn't become a mass participation sport until quite recently, like in the last 10 years, if you will. Before that, it was a very exotic sport. It's like, wait, do you, do you swim? For, do you run for it? Like people were like, what, what is a triathlon, right? And now it's like mainstream. Like everybody knows what a triathlon is, right? And so back then, there's not mass participation. And so instead of developing a bike strictly for triathlon, non-draft triathlon, they were just taking road bikes and putting on TT front ends. Right. And those were UCI illegal, which has nothing to do with triathlon. So that wasn't the most aerodynamic fast bike possible. Yeah. It was just you didn't want to invest the capex and understand the BY because the market wasn't there. So when you have all those legacy systems and all those molds and you, you, know, you can't just drop and, and start something new. Since we came in, I, since I come from the telecom world, I'll give you a good idea of, of what we did. You know, Bell Atlantic, Verizon, those are the big boys. They laid up landlines from New York to LA. They give you a phone booth and you can call this booth to that booth. And then we didn't have any of that infrastructure. We came in, like the cell phones, put a tower here, tower there. Hey, you can even walk and talk. Right. And so because we didn't have that CapEx and all that history and, and that, that heaviness, if you will, we were able to kind of leapfrog and started from the ground up in the wind tunnel saying, forget the UCI. This has nothing to do with triathlon. How can we make the fastest bike possible? Right. right. And, and that's what we did for triathletes. And that's where the Ventum 1 came in. If you look at it again, it's got no down tube. It's got new seat stays. It's got an integrated water bottle on the top tube. It's an integrated water bottle. Yeah, 1.4 liter Bro, water bottle. Yeah. Integrated. Sexy, dog. Because you know You don't why. even have to take your hands off the Yeah, you don't have bars. to take your hands. And so, so here's a good example. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Yeah. Because think so about smart. it. These bottles and bottle cages. Yeah, fuck they, them. They also make the shit look ugly. Yeah, and, and, and. and, and I'm going to put cages on my shit. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? This bike looks so much better without this plastic. And they slow you down. Yeah, of course. Right? They cost yeah. you an arrow Drag. penalty. So mm. this, this, this way we did it. Yeah, I'm loving this. This right? is smart. So that's kind of how, okay. that's why we started there. It's an, it's an industry that we knew. It's a sector that we knew. But we fully realized that that was just the starting block. Yeah. And that we were going to go into road. We're going to go into gravel. And we've got some yeah. fun stuff coming out. Did you have friends in the uh, triathlete yeah. space that could, like, help you promote it too? Because that's a, to yeah. your point, the marketing thing is oh, ambitious. Yeah. yeah. So interestingly enough, man, we're going to get into all my things. So <laughs> essentially, like, I... I was kind of politically upset that men were getting paid a lot more than women mm -hmm. in the triathlon space and pretty much everywhere. Yeah. Sock, Across anywhere. the board. Across the board. Yeah. So when I started this company, you know, and I had made a couple bucks in, in telecom and you know, I was self-funding it. So I figured I'd get to do what I want. Yeah. I refused to sponsor men. I only sponsored women the first year and paid them. Yeah, no because, way. Yeah. So my... A little so, altruism. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, you know, we had a four-time world champion on our bike for a while. And so... Was it difficult? Like, I'm just trying to think about this. Are, are these people accessible? Are they down? Or is it like they have 14 other people trying to get them? You'd be surprised because the sport was small at the time. And, you know, right. theoretically... A, I would also, imagine everyone's approach, it's approachable. You have, get, yeah. so you have to get someone who's willing to take a risk on a brand new bike That's design. true. And we had... You're absolutely right. But the yeah. integrated water bottle thing? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I want to do a triathlon just to try this right? bike out. I'll, I'll get you a bike. That's crazy. Yeah, I know a guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so you go after women first. And how many yeah. do you sign? First year, I think we signed three. 
Okay. And then okay. the next year we started signing men just because, you know, I mean, the point right. was. I right. want to go into the weeds of this just yeah. because for people listening that have never sponsored an athlete, we talked to Therabody, they had just yeah. gotten into it yeah. and that, that ended up working out for them. Mm-hmm. It's really hard. And what were your expectations going into it, if any? Or were you like, let's just see how this goes? Okay, so triathlon is a very interesting sport because the top, top, like I'm talking top two to three triathletes, mm-hmm. they have a team around them, they have agents, they have managers, and they're, they're making good money. Right. You could be the ninth best triathlete in the world, and you've got none of those resources. Right, it. It's a huge drop. Yeah. And so I didn't realize that. And so, and I'm, this is not knocking any of my pros. I love our pros, but there was a fair level, at least at the time of coaching, right? From media training to how to promote the brand and to, and that's something actually I overlooked. I just didn't realize. I was like, oh, well, you're the pro, you're a professional. You should know how to do this, (laughs) but no, you should know how to swim, bike and run and transition fast. You shouldn't really know like the business etiquette of customer acquisition costs and and what's your most effective way of promoting our brand. Right. And so. So that so was you guys spent a lot of time with them? We did. On that? And yeah, initially okay. we did. We did. If I had more resources, I would have done a lot more of the what coaching. What would you have done? What would you have done, like content-wise or just? Well, I mean, content, we did as much as we can as for a small, but I'm talking more about um, like media training. Okay. Oh. Media training. What's the biggest thing that you saw the weaknesses? Like like if someone asked them about the bike, they couldn't answer the right question? or what? Technically, was... it was ter- perfectly fine. I, it was just very cut and dry. Oh, right? they would just yeah. give the answer. Boom. Yeah. 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 No yeah. exposition or anything like yeah, that. Yeah. You know, it. and like, you Versus know. me being like, it's got an integrated right. water yeah. bottle. Yeah. America, are you hearing <laughs> this? Right? And it's exactly get, it. It's yeah, exactly yeah. it. Like, you know, it. give me a little sizzle. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. like, Add some sex to it. Let's yeah. go. And so it was just very matter of fact. Okay. Um, well, what you're saying is uh, essentially like where the sport of triathlon is going right now is, yeah, you have the, the top like one to three athletes who are getting all the money. And then the rest of them, you see them taking to YouTube and getting yeah. the, part of their salary comes from YouTube ad, re, ad yep. revenue yep. as they're talking about their training and like they're, they're finding creative ways nowadays. But um, five years ago, that yeah. was not the case you're at all. Right. And yeah. so like you see these athletes supporting themselves in any way possible because you're right, they don't have, they barely have enough money for the entry fees. Do you know like in 2013 and 14, most of them had a full-time job, yeah. right? So can you imagine you're trying to train for, let's call it a nine hour race, nine to 10 hours or eight to 10, depending, you know, the course and conditions, but you've got to put in so much training and then you have a 40 hour week day job. Right. Impossible. And, and I don't know how to solve that problem. Like to a degree that is still there, right? And like you said, there's, there are outlets, there's YouTube, there are um, Instagram, you know, you, you get to, you know, you can become an influencer. There, there are more outlets than there were in the past. But I still think like there's so much more, like there's ways to go, ways to go. Well, he got to start a company really young and then exit. And then now you have some cash to try. There you go. Otherwise I don't see it. It's difficult. It is. Too it many is. people pull. And especially if you have kids and stuff, it's, it's very, it's almost impossible. Yeah. No, I mean, I look at the sacrifices that these people make. It's, it's unreal. I couldn't do it. Honestly. Yeah. yeah same. I have the easy job. So do you think that the measure there for for you then, like, there wasn't uh, such a, a straightforward path from the athletes that you were endorsing. Was it then more straightforward to become the title sponsor for Ironman? So Ironman was interesting. Again, I looked at the Ironman contracts and they were very segmented. So, you know, a, a bike brand was like the North American uh, bike brand. And then, but in Europe it was a different bike brand and so on and so forth. So what we were able to do with Ironman is essentially consolidate all that, and it brought us to the global uh, the, the global stage, right? So a tiny little company out of Miami Beach, all of a sudden was pretty mainstream by the end of the contract, right? Six years, it was pretty mainstream everywhere. And you know, Ironman has 300 plus races, so you know, I could go to Estonia and they might know what Ventum is, and Turkey, and Greece, and Egypt, and Malaysia. And so it did what we needed to do, which is kind of bring us to the kind of the global stage, mm-hmm. places that we would have never been able to reach with our own resources. It sounds like F1. It I mean, does. It really does. Yeah. Like that's so fascinating. Yeah. So then what happens once you're at the global stage? Does, is it you got to hammer down more marketing, right? Because it's like the signal. You got one signal. Yeah. And then how do you keep those things going? So, you know, at that point, so we get to the global stage. And then I think this is where the business mentality switches from hey, we got to be heard, we got to be seen, people got to know who we are, to we got to fulfill and deliver yeah. on what we're talking about. 
And I think operationally, I'll, I'll be the first to admit it, we were quite weak. Uh, and there's still room for improvement probably now, but we were not quite ready to fulfill on the promise that we were making, right? I mean, it was ambitious. Yeah. And again, let's go back to the big boys, right? With billion dollar R&Ds and pockets, it's very difficult to be as polished as they were on our first model. But a lot of people like the underdog. A lot of people like something different, 100%. right? And they yeah, didn't, it's a new you know, look. Yeah. Yeah. And so that that helped quite a bit. And, now really you're, and at this time, are you raising capital or are you just are you just using all the money that you're making? And I'm always raising capital. Yeah. I'm always raising yeah. capital. How do you raise capital as a is it three to five X your your revenue? Like um, you mean like when we do evaluation? Yeah. Oh, man, this is interesting. So, so this is this has become my life. Right. And in fact, we're in the middle of a really intense round right now. What round are you? This will be like a quasi series B. But we're going to do a probably, well, not probably, cause, but a debt play mixed with some equity. Okay. So we'll probably take on about $5 million of equity. So that's the thing, too, is like you got to remember, like, I want to make sure I hold as much equity as possible, right? I totally. don't want to dilute myself ever, right? I mean, yeah. put in I think this years. is smart, too. Well, of course, A lot right? of entrepreneurs don't understand the value of this, and they want to give their early investors so much equity, which in the end means they've given themselves a job. Correct. Not, not a hundred percent. Now I got well, I was lucky enough that I did this in a very untraditional way where I was my seed investment, series A investment, whatever you want to call it, right? I mean, I put millions into this. Yeah. And that's why I was able to hold on to so much of my equity, right? As opposed to have an ID and go get money outside, I would be a minority investor today. I want to ask you something specific yeah. about this. Okay. So yeah. when you're in that mindset of, okay, I have a, I have a couple million dollars. Yeah. I'm gonna go throw it at my new project. You know the power of capital though. And so there's a part of you that's uh -huh. saying to yourself, I could go raise five million tomorrow. Yes right? and no. And, yes and, and no. you're buying time. Yes and no. Did you struggle with it? Oh, big time. Okay. Big time. When we talk about raising capital, like my my series A actually was quite easy. Mm -hmm. This round was doing great until COVID sure. really highlighted the supply chain constraints, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I'll be pretty open. We had a $6 million deal that was supposed to close last May. It was perfectly on track. And then at the 11th hour, the investor got spooked Wow! because, you know, again, what we talked about, global container shortages, global this and yeah. this, this, all these yeah. shortages. Like, whoa, I don't want to fund your inventory and I don't want to fund your losses right now while you wait for components, right? Yeah. That's a short-term view though. That's dumb. Yeah. Well, you know, it, but I, get I, it. I would agree. I would agree. Uh, <laughs> I would have been like, cool, thanks. Right. Well, I mean, so this time, it's a, this time it, was, it definitely was a, a harder go around. It's a yeah. harder go around. But we're doing pretty well. And you know what? I've just learned to kind of just change my mindset. Like I thought what a CEO of a bike company was earlier and it was for a long time was play with bikes right i'm being a little simplistic but you know my point like oversee r d oversee this and create and it's fun and community engagement and today my job has nothing to do with that right it is all private equity firms it investors returns and it's just all on the business side i feel like i went to business school in the last two years and it's not necessarily what you think of when you start a company, right? You're dreaming about your bike being in the Tour de France, you know, ridden by Lance Armstrong or this or that. But like, you don't, you don't dream of like beating down a warrant percentage coverage from your, <laughs> from your new private equity firm. And like, yes, we got it down to 4%. Like, no, you don't think about these things. You have a CFO, right? I have a great CFO. <laughs> shout out to your CFO. Uh, shout out to Barrett Brandon, who is a little Great bit, CFO uh, name, by the way. Barrett Brandon. Barrett yeah. Brandon. And it's two first names. You know, yeah. Sometimes so you hear Barrett. Yeah. You made a segue there to Lance. How did you? Yeah. Talk? How did that come about? Because you actually I, do sponsor him. Like, part, so part of your dream was realized, right? Yeah. Well, it, it, we actually don't technically sponsor him. He adopted the brand organically. Did you were conflicted about that at all? Not really. And, okay. and I'll tell you why. Oh, man. Dude, that man. A lot of people are going to hate this podcast, let me tell you. Maybe not. So here's the thing. Lance didn't get to where he got, and I've been talking after his wins. I'm talking like in the, in the hot waters. Yeah. He didn't get in hot waters because of his, of his doping, right? Because everybody was doping. And if you know anything about cycling, especially at that time and the time before that. Well documented. It's been well documented yeah. from like 
cocaine in the 50s, right? Right. right. Even before that, taking trains in the 30s, yeah. Yeah. right? And yeah. so, like, that's been part of the Great sport. Hack. Yeah. 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 So that's not why, you know? Others yeah. doped. They're on TV. They're having great careers. So that's not why. It's the destruction of the denial that in the aftermath of that, that really caused him to fall out of grace. That being said, he is still the best of all times with or without the doping. Like, you know, take everybody on the even playing field. He was still the best. You know, and also we're a country of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. And so it's time to move on. It's time to move on. And I'll tell you why it's time to move on. Because that guy did more for cancer research and cure and possible future cures and drug development than any single human in the world. Yeah, you can't and, mention his legacy without including that. And so, it's such a big part. Yeah, you know, I, I'm not perfect. Far from it. But still, but then to part to 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 have him representing your brand in some way, to me, I would be like, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no man. And it's I, not. And, you know, I'm not saying it's a hard pill to swallow or easy. I'm just saying like, there's a part of me that's got to go. Let me do some calculus here. Let me uh, let me figure this out. I mean. Because I agree with everything you yeah. said, right? I totally agree. Here's what I'll say. The haters are a lot louder than the lovers, always, right? Always. Always. You know, and he is so well-loved and so well-supported. Do I agree with some of the decisions he's made? No, not at all. But, like, that doesn't mean, like, you throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? Like, like this is, like, look, it's always going to be a contentious point, uh, you know, and I'm happy to engage it. I'll tell you a really funny story, though. This guy came at me real hard about having any affiliation with Lance. And I have a personal relationship with Lance. And I, I actually, I, I enjoy hanging out with him. And, you know, I go to Aspen and we have a bit of fun. Love uh, Aspen. Hold yeah. on a second. Aspen or, or Park City? Which one? Oh, Aspen. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Sorry, Fuck PC. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, Sorry, PC. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I'm... By yeah. a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love... See, well, you fucking Park City. No, but hold on. Time on out, though. Shit. Time out, though. Maybe the I, summer's different? The reason I like... Aspen? I said, I'm okay. sorry, uh, Aspen is because I'm pretty bougie and I love the little Nell and eating a Casatua. Who doesn't? But the riding is... Cycling. Yeah, the okay. cycling is actually better in Park City. Snowboarding crushes in Aspen. Ajax really? is that. So much oh, better. Oh, man. Wider. Yeah. All right, anyway, so you guys, you guys you know, hang out in Aspen. Yeah, and so... But some guy was crushing me. Uh, he's like, you know, I can't believe you're doing... I will never buy one of your bikes. You're a disgrace to sight. And, you know, like the, the typical things that yeah, you hear. Yeah, yeah. And I engaged with him. And it turns out that his aunt had cancer and was cured. And like indirectly, it had something to do with the funds and the initiatives and the programs of Livestrong. Mm. I'm like, do you understand what you're saying here? You're hating the guy that may have saved your aunt's life. Yeah, I have a story. My my buddy of mine had testicular cancer and this was in Boston. And the Livestrong Foundation, like he would show me all the paperwork and all of the sessions and the support group. And then he'd have all these events and we would go and he ended up beating it. And when all this bad stuff about Lance came out, he was his biggest fan. He's like, I'll wear my Livestrong bracelet until I die because yeah. it's the one thing that kept me alive. And he was a good friend of mine. And so I got to see that. Yeah. And I thought it was the coolest thing. Yeah. yeah. The coolest thing, the level of it's just detail help full on. Yeah. Like everything was thought through yeah. when it came to this cancer. Yeah, and I love it, and I yeah. love it, and and that's the thing. Like you, you, you gotta look at the whole picture. Do you blame cycling? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, more it's oh, more of a cycling absolutely. issue. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they they really had to clean it up after that. But by the way, or guys, do they? guys, the tour, the tour, the year after all this shit went down was the most boring tour ever because no one was doping. Right. right. They all like were just huddled up, <laughs> tired, yeah. barely moving. Right. And I was just like, why am I watching this? You know, there was no excitement, no looking back, none of the, you know, the classic stuff. And so, so I don't know. I like it. So when it comes to valuation, how do you achieve that? Like, what is it for a biking company? So what is like my desired valuation? Like, or just like the normal, like what, what are the multiples? So So right now, if we say tech is 10, CPG two to five. Well, I can tell you Canyon just traded hands over the summer for a billion dollars at a 15 X EBITDA. Wow. 15. Who, Who acquired them? Um, it was just one private equity firm selling their stake to another. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, so okay. TSG exited. I, I forgot who bought them. Are they trying to make them public? Or are they? Is it, is it a SPAC play? I, I think they'll go public. Yeah, for I think sure. so. Yeah, that Kenny's makes sense. Really, Fifteen really times. Well. That's a SPAC. So it's deal. in the teens right now. Uh, as soon as uh, Cannon Dale traded That's hand at ten x. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Why? Is it? Is it like a, the longevity of the customer? Is it? 
it's a four thousand dollar initial investment that's it, a good question you know I, I that i i don't know why but like i'm seeing it right now 10 is the lowest 18 is the highest that I've seen so That's far. That's incredible. It's pretty good. What is your customer journey? So if I buy one bike, is it that I buy two, three later? Am 50% I- of our customers have two bikes. Okay. We have a 50% returning customer rate. And then they which is, it to are you friends. seeing like, like two of the same or are they jumping from gravel to road to try? Um, so just because by the nature of how we, we brought our bikes to market, a lot of triathlon was first and was there only you know, for a couple of years by, on its own. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the tri folks bought road bikes but then a lot of the road cyclists also bought a gravel bike. And, you know, obviously we went from having 100% of our sales being in triathlon to today triathlon is our smallest segment. It sits at 15%. And 85% is road and gravel. And gravel has only been around for us since December 2020. So we've only had it for 14 months. Gravel will outpace road soon. And obviously triathlon. So the sales mix is totally different. And that's the thing, too, is we developed the gravel bike, which is this one right here, the GS1. So you can tell it's not your typical gravel bike. Super integrated, no cables showing. It's flashy. Yep. It's all about also aerodynamics because all these huge races that we go to, like Unbound, which is a a dirty Kansas. Yeah, it's a gravel race. It's, you know, 200 miles. Actually, Barrett Brandon finished 21st. BB. Shout out to BB. Nice. Yeah, yeah. But the point is... BB, step it up. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, he's got a day job too. So. Right, right. <laughs> so the point is, there are countless miles where you're by yourself. So you're not hiding you know, behind anyone. You're not drafting. So aerodynamics take a play. You know, come at play, I mean. So, so that, that's when we developed the GS1, we were getting pushback from all the engineers, our design firm, and our factories. They're like, what is this? This is ridiculous. You don't need to spend this much money. This is gravel. Because gravel at the time was still the wild, wild west. People are using aluminum frames, cyclocross bikes, hardtail mountain bike. Like, there was no standard, right? And we're like, no, 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 no. We want to take the technology that we've done on the Ventum 1 and the NS1, the road bike, and put it in the GS1, and it doubled our costs, right? And again, everybody's like, this is the dumbest thing ever. Now, we got obviously lucky. There's nothing good about COVID, I would say. But if there's a, you know, I guess a sliver of good news from it was that it really brought people into gravel. And it's really important to see where the demand came from. It wasn't mountain bike. Well, it wasn't mountain bikers moving into gravel. Right. It was road Road cyclists that are moving into gravel. And that's important to know. Southern Stone. Was that? Well, and also because. Yeah. Because the thing is, all the group rides because of COVID got canceled. And a lot of road cyclists didn't want to ride by themselves. They don't feel safe from cars. Mm-hmm. So they looked for the next best thing, which is these fire roads totally. and amazing. Yeah. So what's a road cyclist looking for? Lightweight, snappy, zippy, speedy bike. Not a mountain right? bike. Not a mountain bike. Right. And so that's exactly what this is. So it was like a, it's performance gravel. So it was exactly the right product at the right time. You like the Tesla. You start with the, with the Roadster, then you go to the S, and now you have like the Y. Yeah. Right? You're going that, in that direction. What are the price points for gravel, where do they start? They, uh, they start at four. Four so, thousand. So, you know, first time ever, we had to do price hike. Put it this way. You our, sound like you, like it's not a good thing. Well, I, I just, I, you, you know, like it? I, it I like it, well. you know, performance for all is definitely one of my internal taglines. And we try to lower the barrier of entry to cycling, right? And we do, you know, we have financing available and stuff. Like, like I want more people to ride bikes because I love bikes, right? But our competitors have like raised prices like two to three times in one year. But again, the supply chain, prices, inflation, raw material. I mean, it's just, it's gotten to a point. Do you, you have a financing arm? Or yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not ours. We use a third party called Klarna. But yeah, so you can essentially. That could be a play. Oh, it's it's pretty awesome, man. Oh, doing our own financing. I looked at leasing. But, oh, I shouldn't give you all my secrets. Um, no, I mean, it's a no brainer. So, yeah, yeah, these, yeah. these multiples are 10 to 15. You start yeah. your own financing arm, which yeah. any, I mean, you have a debt play in mind so that you get some debt. Actually, it's not a bad idea. But yeah, no. That's. I, Free money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so much to do, so little time, you know. And Okay, so Ford, how much is a ro- what's a road bike start at? So both the road and gravel start at four. Pretty similar. Okay. Yeah, they used okay. to start a, a little bit less than that. And, and, you know, but what is the triathlon? What is like the... The Ventum 1 disc. I want to win the next uh, triathlon. It starts at like six. Six. Oh, yeah. that's not that big. No, no, okay. no. And, and we'll, that's a brand new model. It just came out during COVID. And we always start with our Halo product. And then we'll start doing some trickle down technology, you know, technology. So the price point will go down with different specs. 
Also, I will say that both big component manufacturers have indicated that they will be making entry level or a more entry level price point uh, component soon, which is obviously going to. Percentage wise, how much of the bike is component cost? Is it like 20, 30? It depends what the component is. So are you a Shimano or are you a SRAM guy? I have a Shimano. Shimano. So, right you know, now. let's play with Durace and Altegra. Yeah. I would say Durace, and let's play only DI2. Let's not talk about mechanical. I would say when you look at the bike, if it's a Durace, it would be roughly 30%. 30, or okay. 40%. And Altegra it's is like 20? Sh- yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, okay. what, one of the biggest actually price points, the biggest is the wheels. Right. Yeah. I mean, obviously the frame, but the frame I make. I have a lot of spread on wheels. A lot of lot of range. Right. Also. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, one of the first things I learned when I bought a bike. People swap them out like crazy as well. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. This is shifting gears a little bit, but oh. uh, I'm curious. Pun intended. I know. Right. Did yes. Ah. Just all, all, all sorts of puns today. Uh, you mentioned in another podcast interview that that building ventum as a company cost you a relationship and and yeah. i know that you just got engaged so i did congratulations yeah oh, congrats a lot on your instagram yeah. thank you congrats yeah. on the engagement thank you. yeah audrey guy. if you hear this i'm Shout curious about like what you learned from 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 the cost of, of building the company and losing that first relationship that you were then able to change and apply to this current one Sounds like you gained a relationship. You didn't really lose it. I know. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so so just a slight correction. I, I lost a relationship during this company, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I think what ended up happening there is when you're – and this person was a professional triathlete, right? And so, you know, you're working – all day and then you come home to work and it's and now your your significant other is in your work and a i think what, i mean i need to answer your question and, and and to answer your question i'll say what i've learned from that is to separate mm-hmm. right it's to separate and it's still very hard for me i am a such an emotional guy guys like yeah. you can probably tell a little bit like and so i put all my heart in it i put everything into it but then sometimes i get the blinders and i don't see anything else right and I was actually thinking about this because you know when you're in a startup especially I guess we've been in an eight-year startup but you're always two months away from bankruptcy right or less and if anybody tells you otherwise in a product-based service then maybe they figure out something I don't but so it's always this stress and I just needed to separate and understand that the stress will always be there in fact it's a lot more than when that relationship, like I look back at those days and I'm like, oh, dear, that was child's play. That was your problem. That's nothing. I could solve that tomorrow. And so the stress is always going to be there. In fact, it's going to keep increasing and you got to separate and deal with it. And then the other thing, too, is a little bit of a maybe a morbid exercise. But I'm like, hey, what if Ventum dies tomorrow? That's a great exercise. Right. By yeah. Me. Ventum dies tomorrow. Worst case scenario. It, you play know what? It out. I had tied my identity with Ventum because I'm passionate, because 90% of my net worth is invested in here, and because of, I tied my identity to Ventum, that if Ventum died, I die. And to separate that was one of, and I'm still working at it, right? I think if Ventum died, I am like very wounded now, right? And I'd like to get to a place where I can move on if Ventum dies and understand that, look, it's been eight years, done some great things, businesses fail all the time, Two years of the hardest years of our lives have just happened. Uh, certainly the hardest year in the, in the bike industry. So to separate your identity from your company, I think is actually very smart if you want to keep a sane head. Speaking of, by the way, Audrey, you know, we're, uh, one thing I didn't know is I thought getting engaged was like the milestone, right? Like, <laughs> like, like getting, I, I did it. I got engaged. Now let me mm-hmm. just cruise for the next couple of years, right? Oof. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See, yeah. see, nobody told me. It's my first engagement, all right? Nobody told me. Yeah, no. And what I realized is immediately minutes after people find pump. out. Yeah. They're like, yeah. when are you getting married? Everyone wants yeah. to know. When are you getting married? Yeah. And I know. In a post-pandemic getting... world, it's going to be on a Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah, yeah right, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so, and so they were like, I guess I have to talk about it. You know, I was like, I thought I had a lot of time. And so then, you know, I was talking with Audrey. I'm like, Audrey, what about next summer, which is summer 2023? And by the way, our leading, our leading venue is Aspen uh, at the Little Nell on top of, of uh, Ajax. It. Yeah, so it. we'll see. I mean, you know, and we got with the wedding planner, which again, I feel like it's so early. And you're like, oh, well, these are the weekends left for summer 2023. Yeah. These are your choices. Got to put a deposit down. Make up your mind. Really, like, I got engaged two weeks ago, guys. Yeah, you're like, basically starting a company. 
It's a, crazy. A little mini company. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, during yeah, these yeah, next yeah. two years. Is Little Nell special to you for any particular reason? I love the Little Nell. Well, um, me too. I'm just curious. Really? Yeah. Um, so Jonathan Philman, shout out to him. He's the general manager of the Little Nell. He's a good friend of mine. We do, we have a partnership with the Little Nell. So we do a camp called Clip In with Christian, Christian Vandeveld, okay. who was yeah. also on the U.S. Postal team and also rides Ventum. And so we do this high-end experience and it's hosted at the Little Nell. When is it? Um, it's in August. You should come. I'm going to come. Oh, it's incredible. We've, we've been talking about doing a podcast trip to Aspen. Yeah. I've never been, so yeah. I can't join this argument of Park City versus Aspen. Yeah. You can. You don't need to join it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have two yeah. professional opinions yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we, we've been talking about it, and like, it's one of our goals yeah. coming up in the next year or two. It's, it's beautiful. So I, I was raised in Switzerland. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but in Lausanne, Switzerland. And in fact, I'm going there on Thursday. Nice. Uh, yeah, I'll be there for a couple of weeks. Uh, for the ring tour you're doing the ring tour now yeah right (laughs) exactly exactly Uh, me my brother and and his fiance a whole bunch of friends go skiing in Zermatt but oh nice yeah Aspen feels a lot like Switzerland Mm. it's perfectly manicured Park City is 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 amazing but it's it's rugged you know like if I see somebody coming down with a cowboy hat and and a horse I wouldn't be surprised right yeah but like Aspen, it's like it's bougie, bro. Yeah, hey, Aspen is Formula <laughs> One, and Park City is NASCAR. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Talk- oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I can go home Look, now. Yeah, it's over. Fun, it's over. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'm sure you can edit that out. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Park City. People love Park City. I think it's because they grew up skiing in like New England on yeah. ice yeah. and Southern not used to having food options. Yeah. When you go to Aspen. You're at the top. You can get a nice glass of champagne, which my wife loves. Yeah, yeah. You can get a protein Five bowl. Nine. You can get a gluten-free pizza. Little Nell Kitchen serves you at the top, which is Absolutely. like an un, like an extraordinary level of food while you're just having a good time. And the park said you cannot do that. And you know, you're absolutely right. It's like a cantina style. And like, for example, when I just said Zermatt in Switzerland, there are several Michelin star restaurants on the on slope. The, yeah. Yeah, you stop yeah. and you have a Michelin star meal. Yeah. And Aspen best. is the closest thing to that, right? And and again, like in terms of natural beauty, riding, summer, Park City and Utah in general is just absolutely gorgeous. Like we've got 14 hours of sunlight. We start with a century ride in the morning. We end up on the boat. Do you provide the, the bikes? Is we that can. part of the part yeah. of the thing? Yeah, 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 100%. We put okay. road and gravel. Okay. But Aspen's got like Casa Tua, which is one of my favorite restaurants. It started in Miami Beach. I like Matsuhisa there. Yeah, Matsuhisa. We but, crush that. My but, like, wife you know, loves that. It, it's I'm going to go. I'm going to go. It's a good place real. to be. Yeah. I'm gonna, Come. This is going to be an easy. You know, he, <laughs> easy we, we were setting up uh, yesterday and Diego was like looking at the bikes. He doesn't ride much anymore. And he told me he's he's afraid of of falling in love with it again. Yeah. Which is why. He the problem ride. I have is like I just go all in on things. And so yeah. I picked up tennis four years ago, was doing coaching three times a week, joined a tennis club. Uh huh. Because it's just you versus you. And so it's like a game. It's like how good can you get at the sting? Yeah. And how good can your technique get? And I just go fully in on that. Yeah. And so it used to be golf at one time. It was cycling at one time. And so the thought of like getting on a bike again, yeah, just to experience the same, yeah, but the, like the same I just pull. get pulled in that direction. Just, just you, start a bike company. You get free bikes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I already found one. I like yeah. so much. I got the Ventum. Yeah. yeah oh, I appreciate man. that. What else should we know? What else should we know before? Yeah. We, what else uh, is in the future? What is the future? So I got to be careful. I guys, yeah, I get in trouble course. all the time. Go public. Yeah. Barry Let's Brand go BB. Gonna, yeah. It's gonna, it's gonna kill me. Um, not going public. I yeah. can promise you that. Okay. We still have ways to go before we could even consider that. We got a f- fun products. Uh, we're yeah, I would in. imagine you go, you go, you go something more lightweight on the dollar, on the budget maybe. We would like that. I mean, again, just to so, get like early access, like the Model Y. Uh, yeah, like, yeah. I mean, eventually. Look, once the supply chain normalizes again, and by the way, we're about a couple years away. That's not a joke. Yeah, you think two I, two years, right? I think two years from now, yeah. things will have calmed down. We may even have an oversupply. Who knows? But right now, it's very hard. Like we're pivoting all the time, right? Like yeah. a good example is, I think I can say this. We have a, a <laughs> we have an e you can say it. yeah yeah <laughs> we have an e gravel bike. So this bike, oh, cool. but with a five hundred and four watt motor that Shimano is going to be. I hope I can say this, releasing in Q3 of this year. Okay. So it's a whole new platform. So that e-bike for us, yeah. and it's going to range over 100 miles an hour. It top speeds at 28 miles an hour. It's going to be a beast. This thing, That's you'll be able to jump on it. You could ride from here to Santa Barbara, have lunch, charge, and come back. Like, And that's what I plan on doing with it. It's like, I that's cannot awesome. wait. That's a good day. You can have drop bars or flat bars. It's going to be amazing. But we weren't planning to come out with that model for another year or two. 
However, because Shimano is making this new system, it's called the 801 platform, they dedicate line space for those new components, right? And so we were like, wait a minute, we had the opportunity to enter and, and get in line in that line space. So because we can get it, we moved up the release and production of our e-gravel based on the supply chain, right? Taking advantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how you have to think. And, and by the way, that's just the tip of the iceberg of pivoting of what we've had to do. But, you know, that's a good example of what dictated our next moves was, was, was the supply chain. But I cannot wait for that bike. Is there guys. a metaverse play, you think? I don't know. People have been talking about that a lot recently. Yeah, it depends uh, who you well, talk well, to. There's you two know, camps. Zwift like, is almost uh, a good like intermediary. Guys, you want to hear a, a heartbreaking story about Zwift? Somebody reminded me of that. In fact, her name is Sara. Reminded me of that maybe a week ago. I was approached to be one of the first outside investors in Zwift in 2014. And she pulled up the email and sent it to me recently and was like, hey, I've got a buddy of mine who's starting this thing. It's going to revolutionize the cycling industry, indoor training, you guys should really, I'm investing, do you want to meet him? And I was like, ignore! Oh. <laughs> and now I'm That's like on Zwift every day in the winter. But yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. The minute, yeah, no, it hurts, yeah. dude, dude, dude. It's one of my biggest regrets. That's my biggest fear. It's my biggest it's regret. It's getting that email. I get decks all the time, we yeah. invest in some stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, had I put in what I what they want me to put in? It's also a function of timing. It's like, you have to be in a state where you have both time and money. But it's like, if you don't have the time, you're going to miss out. And you know that. And so it's like, but it, it's a shitty when you miss out on something that came across your desk. You know? It yeah. came across in such a, it wasn't like, oh, I heard about, it's like, please invest. And I was like, no, you just said something that's so, so accurate. You have to be time, money, and the right frame of mind. Yeah. The reason I passed, I had just exited my telecom company in May, May 31st, 2014. It's probably like you know, the wealthiest I've ever been, right? Yeah. And then June 1st, dude, I just started getting hit up. Invest in this, invest in that, invest in real estate. And so I had the time and I had the money, but my headspace wasn't in it right. because I was being attacked by so yeah. many you parties. Sift through you got to learn different games. Yeah. yeah. What and are the valuations? What's the real estate play? And I knew nothing at right. that point, right? right. And right. I, I literally jumped on the first like three opportunities that were presented to me. You could have said hello to me and I'm like, yes, yeah. I invest, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And then I started realizing like, whoa, 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 you got to be careful. Totally. And that's when Zwift came around in a place where I was trying to be a little bit more conservative and totally risk averse. Right. And I, if it was the first play, I would have thrown millions at it. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it But goes. then I wouldn't be sitting but here with you, fine gentlemen. Know, right? <laughs> You'd be an ass. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, man. guys. This was awesome. I hope to come back and join you again. That was our conversation with Dean Noor of Ventum. Keep an eye out this week because on Thursday, we're releasing a brand new segment of the show that will only be available on YouTube. I won't give too much away, but I can say that we really pushed Dia to his limits. We can't wait for you all to see it. So head on over to our YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button. We are found at Startup Storefront on every social media platform, except for Twitter, where you can find us at STS Podcast LA. The team consists of Diego Torres Palma, Natalia Capolini, Lexi Jameson, Owen Capolini, and me, Nick Conrad. Our music is by Double Touch. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.